on camera. Today is May 9th, 2016, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Peggy Hilliard, another volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Jay Pryor, who served in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War. Mr. Pryor's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Pryor, and, and thanks for participating in the progress. Thank you. In, in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? Full name is John Gatewood Pryor, Jr., but I go by Jay and uh, live in Dunwoody, uh, Georgia, just outside okay. of Atlanta. Can you tell us a little bit about your early years? I grew up in Albany, Georgia. Um, my mother was an eighth grade uh, English teacher, and uh, my dad worked for Gulf Oil. And uh, during the war, dad, dad was a little old for World War II, so he worked at Turner Field, and uh, the Air Force Base down in Albany. And uh, he told me, uh, seeing prisoners there at Turner Field sometimes, the prisoners have a, a yellow P on, on their back. But anyway, um, in 50, 1959, we moved to Atlanta, uh, moved to Sandy Springs, and um, mother resumed her teaching. Dad continued working for Gulf Oil until he retired. And um, so um, I went to Sandy Springs High School, which is now Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you, where, did you, where, did you, where did you go to school after high school? Uh, after high school, went to, uh, I went to Georgia Tech for four quarters and uh, then transferred to Reinhardt College, got an associate in arts degree from Reinhardt College, and then went to the University of Georgia, which was my dad's alma mater and also uh, my sister had also gone to Georgia. Uh, graduated from Georgia in 1967, and uh, this was when the Vietnam War was building up. Um, the, the largest number of troops uh, during the war was in 1968. I knew when I graduated that I was going to be going to Vietnam one way or another, and I preferred to go on my own terms and uh, went down to Athens uh, to the recruiting office for the Navy and uh, took the test for OCS and was fortunate enough to, to be able to do well enough to, uh, to go to OCS when I graduated from, from Georgia. Um, I like the traditions of the Navy. Um, I had spent a lot of time, my family had a cabin on Lake Lanier and uh, spent a lot of time out on Lake Lanier. Uh, back in Albany and when I was in elementary school, uh, they would put us in a school bus and take us from the elementary school to the YMCA and that's where I learned how to swim. So I always feel like I'm a pretty decent swimmer. Back in the days, we learned to swim without swimming trunks, which is something that's <laughs> totally unheard of these days. I mean, goodness knows the lawsuits that would ensue. But anyway, that's the truth. Um, but I, I feel comfortable on the water, and so anyway, went into the Navy um, and went to OCS. Where was OCS? OCS is a, the only OCS was Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. So, you know, I um, I hadn't gotten out of Georgia all that much other than going to Oklahoma to visit my, my aunt and uncle with, with mom and dad. Um, so it was kind of a big deal to, to take off and drive in my uh, Buick Skylark um, up to uh, Newport, Rhode Island. First, uh, first night I got as far as, as Charlotte, North Carolina, which, you know, is like a four hour drive and I'm wondering, why didn't I go farther than that? I mean, I was pretty poor. But anyway, went from on up to, uh, to Newport. Um, remember parking the car in the parking lot. And I didn't know how, how, when I would see the car again. And um, people yelling at you, uh, orders in your left hand, gear in your right, expedite, expedite, and you're running all over the place. They were issued clothing there, your, all your, your uniforms for, uh, for OCS. And um, we were told, I clearly remember this, some of you will lose weight and some of you will gain uh, plan accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was kind of an introduction to the, to the military, <laughs> the Navy particular. So um, 
What time of year was it? Went into, I got there on August the 19th. Okay. Uh, received my commission December the 15th. So I was, I was really a pretty good time of year. It got cold in Newport, but it wasn't horrific. Um, uh, kind of kept up with the Georgia football games from as, as best I could. Um, and we, uh, OCS was, uh, I, you know, it was, uh, it, it wasn't a lot of fun, but we, we got through it together. Our, each company kind of bonded fairly well. So, um, there were some guys, one of the things you had to do was jump off a 30 foot tower into the water, into the swimming pool. And, uh, some guys did just flat out did not know how to swim, which was pretty interesting. Um, and, you know, when you get in the water, you take your trousers off and make a, a, a kind of a makeshift uh, life preserver from the trousers. And um, I had, at Georgia Tech, I had gone through the swimming program with Freddie Lanou, who was a, kind of an icon at Georgia Tech back in the day. And uh, back then, he would, you know, you'd get in the water with your hands and feet with your tied together, tied, and you'd just be, learn how to bob and survive. Okay. But anyway, so... Um, the detailer came around toward the latter Explain part. Explain what a detailer is. The detailer is the guy is a very important person in the life of military, at least in the Navy. I may be the same name in other branches. I don't know. But that's the person who gives you your assignment. So the detailer uh, came and questioned each person about what they wanted, what their first choice of duty station would be. And um, when I was 14 years old, I got my first ham radio license. I still have a ham radio license, K4OGG. Um, so I requested, I figured if I were going to be in the Navy, I might as well, by golly, be in the real Navy. So I requested small combatant, West Coast, and communications. And lo and behold, I got exactly what I asked for. I was assigned to a communications officer school uh, in San Diego. So I, w I reported there, I believe it was the 31st of December of 67, and was there for six weeks. Um, this was d actually during the first TET. So I was, my, I was assigned first to comm school and then to the USS Hissom, DER 400. The Hissom was in the Western Pacific at the time, and I, I, I didn't, you know, didn't really know where. I found out that, that she was uh, doing uh, Taiwan patrol. So um, I first went from San Diego to San Francisco, flew into San Francisco because I was going to fly out of Travis to get over to uh, the Western Pacific or Westpac. And... Um, so I land in San Francisco and I tell the cab driver that I want, you know, here I am, a, an ensign as green as they come. I wanted to stay in a hotel that was not all that expensive. Well, San Francisco has a lot of five-star hotels and, and this one didn't have a star. This one, uh, I've wondered if he got a kickback. But, so he takes me to this hotel and um, of course there were, there were sites in San Francisco that, that they didn't have in Atlanta at the time. And I went out and came, came in fairly late at night. But then, like at 3 in the morning, 2, 3 in the morning, uh, I'm on the 12th floor, incidentally, I start hearing these, sounded like ex muffled explosions. And um, so I wake up, get up, get out of bed, open the, the door to the hall, and there is smoke in the, in the entire hall. And uh, fortunately, my room happened to be a room that had a fire escape. So I put all my stuff out on the landing of the fire escape. And this fire escape was one of these fire escapes that is strictly vertical. So it's just a vertical ladder, 12 stories, with the little hoop, you know, around it for safety, I guess. And so I go down the fire escape and to the coffee shop across the street and watch the firemen come in and... And what it turned out to be, um, the guy next door had been partying a lot more than I had, I guess, and had uh, gone, to, gone to sleep with a lighted cigarette and started a fire in his room. It was a room right next to mine. 
and those explosions that I was hearing were uh, the windows popping really? out of the uh, of the room. So, um, so anyway, so I, I get to Travis. I fly over to um, to Japan, and um, let me refer to my notes. Let's see, where was it that I landed in Japan? Um, Tachikawa, by way of uh, Hawaii and uh, and Wake Island. Tachikawa, I had a uh, a uh, of course I was pretty grubby, you know, flying all that distance, and mm -hmm. so I I went to the, the barber there in the airport and. He did the, the hot towel deal and the, and the straight razor shave. It was so nice. I, that was just really heaven. So anyhow, so get there, and uh, then I fly to, uh, to Taiwan and land in Taipei and learn that the ship was down in Kaohsiung. Now, Taipei, uh, or uh, Taiwan is a long island. Uh, Kaohsiung, uh, Keelung is in the north part of the island. Kaohsiung is down at the southern part of the island. So I got a military flight to go from, I stayed in the King Hotel a night, I guess. I guess it was just one night there in, in, uh, in uh, Taipei. So I'm, I'm flying from Taipei down to Kaohsiung. And um, so I get all my stuff on the plane. Plane takes off, we land. I get all my stuff out, go out to the, where the taxis are in line and nobody wants to drive me to the dock. And I, I can't figure out what, what's the deal. I mean, why wouldn't they want to do that? So finally I get this guy that, that agrees that he would take me to the Kaohsiung uh, docks. And um, so I get in the car and we start, start off and it takes five hours because it seems that this military plane has landed like halfway down the island. <laughs> and the pilot didn't see fit to let me know <laughs> that we were not down at Kaohsiung, we were somewhere in between the two. So you were completely so, on your own. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with all my all my stuff, you know, more stuff than you sh I should have had probably. And um, fortunately, the, uh, the the driver was able to speak some English. He had learned English uh, fighting in the Philippines in World War II, which is kind of an interesting thing. Get down to Kaohsiung, and of course, the ship is left by this time, by the time I get there, and is heading for Taipei, back up north. So um, I get on uh, China Air Transport, Cat Airlines, and we fly uh, back up, and, and I, I got to the ship uh, in uh, Keelung Harbor. Keelung is the harbor for Taipei. So um, we were in and out of Keelung Harbor and also Kaohsiung doing market time. Uh, not market time, but Taiwan Patrol. And Taiwan Patrol uh, came about in 1950 when Truman, with Truman uh, put it into place. Uh, in 49, um, Chairman Mao had run the Chinese nationalists out of mainland China, and they had gone to Taiwan. And the thought at the time, and it was pretty, they, people thought it was a sure thing that uh, Chairman Mao would, would follow and, and attack Taiwan and take over Taiwan. As it turned out, he did not do that, but the, the, the president wanted to show the strength and to show that we were in support of Taiwan. And if, uh, if Chairman Mao wanted to bring his army over and attack Taiwan, then he'd have to come through us first. Interestingly enough, uh, one of the things I learned there, the um, Chairman Mao had the Fourth Army. The, his Communist Army was the Fourth Army. And so the number four in Taiwan is much like the number 13 here. It's looked at it being an unlucky number. And uh, some, some, some high rises don't have a fourth floor because of that and so forth. But so anyway, so I finally get, get on board the Hissom and um, would we, you, you mentioned earlier that it was a DER. Can yes. you explain what that is? A, a DER is a destroyer escort radar picket ship. Okay. Um, she was originally a destroyer, uh, strictly a destroyer escort. Um, she was launched in at the end of World War II, actually made eight trips escorting ships across the Atlantic. 
uh, during World War II. And it was credited with shooting down a, a, a German uh, fighter um, uh, in somewhere around North Africa. So that's what the deep. And so then after World War II, um, she was reconfigured with uh, high highfalutin radar, a sophisticated radar system, better way of putting it, uh, and put up on the dew line. So she would be stationed up on the dew line. Um, one thing about the, the, the DER was the fact that we had twin diesel engines, which made us capable of uh, long, long time, uh, lengthy, independent, independent deployments. So we could go a long time by ourselves, steaming independently, and did not have to have the, uh, the uh, underway replenishment that a lot of the other ships would have to have. So um, that was, uh, and so then as Vietnam came about, um, she did, uh, we did primarily um, Taiwan patrol and market time and gunfire support. What was market time? Market time was a program where we would uh, look for ships that were tracking from the north to the south uh, along the coast of Vietnam. Um, and because the North Vietnamese would take supplies and, and ammunition and whatever and put them in a trawler and take them down. Now, I don't think they did it all that much because of our patrol. I like to think because of our patrol. Um, realistically, well, the idea was that we would look for a vessel that was tracking from the north to the south. We would stop them and uh, board them and search them. And we would have a, um, a South Vietnamese Navy uh, officer with us as an interpreter. Um, realistically, if they were bad guys, they would run from you. But if they stopped, usually, I, I don't know if any, I hadn't heard of any experience where uh, that was anything bad when they would stop. But um, the, uh, we, never, we never had to shoot one. But uh, a ship that we relieved, uh, actually a Coast Guard cutter, the Androscoggin, um, had actually had one run from them and they, they followed and sunk it. So um, that's, uh, that was market time. We would simply be on patrol in a given area off, uh, we would spend a lot of time off of i -Corps and uh, up in the north, and, uh, but we did get down to some of the others. I, and I would occasionally have to go into the beach, uh, went into Vung Tau a few times and into Da Nang a few times because I was the RPS custodian, uh, RPS being the registered publication system. So I was responsible for all the classified materials on the ship and had to account for every piece and ensure that they were disposed of properly. How, how um, large was the crew of the Hissel? Ah, gosh, the crew was like 124. Five to 50, somewhere in that. The Hissom was 306 feet long, uh, displaced 1,700 tons, had uh, 12 officers. I had 24 men reporting to me and two chiefs, uh, which is uh, a, little, a little daunting for someone as green as I was and fresh out of college and you know, and um, the, the only water, the biggest body of water was, I had seen was Lake Lanier. Uh, but nevertheless, I had good guys uh, working for me, and uh, and they carried carried the load. So um, yeah, we did Taiwan patrol and uh, and market time, and some gunfire support. Um, my ship, the Hissom, actually is the only DER that was credit, credited with some KI some killed in actions. Um, for some, some Arvin troops were coming, uh, coming into an area and they, they knew that they were bad guys in there and so they asked for gunfire support, and, which we did, and, and they came in and, um, and verified some of, the, some of the stuff that we had Was that an anomaly or did, did you yeah. do that? Part yeah, of that the... was pretty much. Um, we did some gunfire support, but not, not a whole lot. I think our, our main emphasis by far was, was market time. Um, we, we had, as you asked the question, I served under two different commanding officers. Um, 
The first was James A. Barber, Jr. And Captain Barber is a very wise and is a very erudite uh, naval officer, uh, went, uh, spent time in the War College, uh, Naval War College, after his commands at sea, had several commands at sea. Um, great guy, um, as I say, erudite, nice gentleman. Second commanding officer, good guy, different. Uh, blood and guts, get me a mission. I want to get out there and kill some commies kind of guy. Right. But uh, he was Morton E. Toole, Jim Toole. Uh, interestingly enough, it was Toole that, that ultimately became a rear admiral, whereas uh, Barber retired as a captain. We had another guy on our ship who, who made rear admiral as well, uh, a guy named Bob Chamberlain. Bob was our supply officer. So uh, part, part of my duties as communications officer uh, was to break, break out the encoded messages that came to the ship. They would come in the, in the form of, of five-letter groups, and each day there would be a, 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 a code for setting, that we had a basket. This basket was cylindrical, it's just a little cylinder thing, and it had a number of rotating pieces within the basket, and you'd have to set these things properly put it in a typewriter type contraption and type out these letters that came in on the, in, in, mm -hmm. in, the encrypted stuff and to type out whatever it was that was being said. Well, the, the supply officer does not stand underway watches. And um, so Bob would be the one who'd have to be waked up in the middle of the night and have to come into the radio room and, and um, figure out what it was. And you don't even know who it's to. I mean, you can get as far as, as the addressee, and then you can stop if it's not to you. So, um, but anyhow, he had that duty. But he made he was the number two guy ultimately in the supply corps for the Navy, which cool. is pretty impressive. Uh, great guy, Boston, from Boston. How long were you? And I don't know what to call them. Your underway periods. I mean, you started from Taipei, went to sea. How long were you at sea before you went back? To it would vary. Uh, I, you know, I would guess that we would typically be underway probably a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. It would be, an, uh, there was one particular time I, I had in my notes, uh, there was one time we were underway for 31 days, but that was unusual. Uh, typically it would be two to three weeks. And you get paid just before you get to port. So <laughs> that didn't bode well for a lot of the <laughs> sailors trying to save money for one thing or another. Did you ever have shore patrol? I did have show, I had show patrol Christmas Eve one time. Um, I forgot, I'm not even sure which year that was. It was either 68 or 69, well, it would have been 68. Uh, and uh, so we were going, it was, it was one, of the, one of the ports in Taiwan. I don't remember which one, uh, but you know, I was going around with the, with the real sort of shore patrol, the guys who knew what they were doing. And, um, we go to this one bar, and there, lo and behold, there's a booth of my radio man, the guys that, and so, Mr. Pryor, want a Coke? I mean, being from Atlanta, you know, you can't refuse a Coke. Well, there wasn't much Coke in that thing that, that he gave me. Uh, now, I don't think I drank much of it, but uh, yeah, but I did have shore patrol duty occasionally. You get to see the sights. That's right, that's right. Now, now that brings up my first trip to Hong Kong. We also, on our DER, on the HISM, we had the enviable task of being SOPA Admin Hong Kong. And that means we were the SOAP Senior Officer present afloat for Hong Kong. And we handled all the administrative duties necessary uh, for, for men who were on leave, uh, the naval personnel who were on leave in Hong Kong and, and on R&R. &R. Um, the other ships, we would assume their communications responsibilities, which of course as a comm officer was a, was a big deal. Um, and a lot of the, some of the guys, the wealthier guys, would bring their wives over. For, because we were there for three weeks. We were th three weeks in Hong Kong Harbor is not bad duty. Um, but the first time we got to Hong Kong, we were out there in the, in the Hong Kong Harbor and uh, it's finally time for me to go ashore for the first time. So, you know, I'm standing there on the quarter deck and 
and in the Navy, uh, officers get to go in civilian clothes and enlisted men are required to wear the uniform. Anyway, I'm standing on the quarter deck ready to go and here comes a motor whale boat and it comes closer and closer and lo and behold, there's my lead, my first class uh, signalman, a guy who reports to me with his hands handcuffed behind him and so they bring him up there and turn him over to us and so we go up on the forward part of the ship, the forecastle, and he starts crying and saying that nobody loves him and, and, and he had gotten into a bar fight and it was like, oh my gosh, what, what do I do with this? <laughs> they didn't tell you about this at, at OCS. Uh, but that was my introduction to Hong Kong. But Hong Kong was a great town, a uh, great city. Uh, it's still, uh, it, um, it would be interesting to be there. Of course, this was before, uh, before it was communist. This was when the British uh, still had control of Hong Kong. But, and, and interestingly enough, um, the, uh, the water at Hong Kong was supplied, came from mainland China. But it was such a source, a financial sor uh, cash cow for the communists that they, uh, they didn't mess with that. I mean, they continued to supply Hong Kong with water. Um, How many ports in the, in the Asian waters did you visit? Mm, well, um, we went, let's say where's Hong Kong, uh, the, the two in Taiwan, and then we would occasionally, it would be pretty unusual for us to, to go into a uh, Vietnamese port. But we did go into Vung Tau, uh, Da Nang. Um, so that was kind of the cycle? Yeah, Taipei absolutely. Ports and, and yeah. once in a while. Taipei. We would also go occasionally into Subic Bay in the Philippines. Uh, infamous <laughs> yes. Subic Bay along the Po River. Yes. Uh, monkey meat being sold at the bridge. <laughs> Um, yes, we did do that uh, as well. Um, what was the, uh, you know, we hear about typhoons and things like that in the Pacific. Were you, was your ship ever? Uh, my second cruise uh, on the Hissom, I, I made three trips to Westpac. Okay. Um, I, I, I did a little over half of the first cruise under, under Captain Barber, came back to a home port at Pearl Harbor, went back for a second full cruise under Captain Barber, and um, after that second cruise, I was, had a change of duty station. And uh, after being the comm officer for the DER, I was a uh, comm officer for Destroyer Squadron out of Long Beach, California. Um, so, it, but you know, we, we hit, uh, we, uh, we stopped at Guam, uh, Okinawa, um, those, those different spots. places, Philippines. Now, after, after the first cruise, uh, as we were coming, coming home, we, we were fortunate enough to be able to have uh, an R&R port. So we went from the Vietnam, Vietnam area. I can't remember if we actually left from Vietnam or from the Philippines, but it doesn't make any difference. We went down south to, uh, to Australia. And uh, so one of the things that the Navy uh, has as a tradition is the transition from a from a polywog to a shellback. So we had, in fact, uh, I have here. Let's see, a photograph. Of well, I thought I did of uh, you have to ki kiss the belly of King Neptune and King Neptune's belly of course is is uh, covered in all kinds of things this is this is the this is the one officer we had on our ship who was an, a graduate of Annapolis <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Lieutenant Earl Buck and uh, Earl's a great guy. I mean, he uh, he, um, he he took it well. Earl later, we were doing a towing exercise off of Hawaii, and uh, Earl was a Mustang. He had been an enlisted man before going to Annapolis and becoming an officer, and he was a hands-on kind of guy. I probably still is. 
But he was on the, uh, on the fantail as we were doing this towing exercise and the cable that we were towing parted and came up and opened up his head. Um, my, my best friend had been a hospital corpsman and they put a salt compress there and uh, he was in the hospital in Hawaii for a long, long time but thankfully he has apparently made a full, full recovery. We would go visit him there. But um, actually I should show some of these things. This is um, this here. Uh, this is after officer's quarters, or AOQ, and this is a typical bunk for a destroyer escort. I, my rack was up on the top. This is actually, there's a third one. There are three, three racks high there. Um, Back in the day, the, uh, there was a mustache growing contest. I, I, I didn't win, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, with, the, with the ensign bar, so that was fairly yeah. new. Wearing your cover at a rakish angle. These, uh, here we see uh, me with uh, some of the men in my division. That was after an inspection of some sort. We had a ringside seat, I believe, I believe this is an A4 here, and he has come on his bombing run. He dropped his ordnance here, and you can see the explosion, and here he is pulling up and out. We were offshore uh, during, uh, during that. Was that taken with, with just a normal lens on the camera? Um, I had a 200 millimeter lens, I think. One of the great things about Hong Kong, I bought a Nikon FTN there and uh, paid something like $230 or something for it. This is typical um, uh, fishing junks, Vietnamese fishing junks. And you would, you would come up for a night watch on the bridge and you'd think, oh my gosh, they'd just see these little lights out there in all, all around you. And you didn't want to run into one of them. Uh, although there were I have heard of it happening where they would try to get run into by a U.S. Uh, Navy ship so they could get paid for it. This is um, me with, uh, there I am, and here is, this is B.B. Sams. B.B. was our, our second weapons officer, and uh, B.B. actually is a very successful commercial artist, uh, lives um, just outside of Atlanta, uh, did uh, numerous illustrations for children's books. But we visited a Taiwanese ship, and that was when that was. Um, typical, typical Hong Kong, Hong Kong Harbor back in the day. Now I think it's all probably filled in with, with uh, high-rise buildings. Um, this was a resettlement house. Um, the, uh, the people who had tried to, to escape from communist China and made it to Hong Kong. And um, uh, it's just an interesting thing. Now, this, this is the HISM. This is the USS HISM, DER 400. And this picture, I took this picture, and you see here, there is the cameraman. We had uh, George Syverston, who was a CBS reporter. Uh, came aboard the Hissom and wanted to do a story about uh, market time. So he came aboard. I went in the motor whale boat with uh, Syverston and his sound man and his cameraman. And um, the ship just did numerous uh, pass, pass, pass bys and, uh, and they filmed it. And there was a, uh, a news story that was put on uh, CBS, uh, Walter Cronkite's station at, at some time after that. He was subsequently, subsequently killed in Cambodia, uh, I think with his sound man, but Syverston uh, did not make it through the, through, the, through the war. This was, there was the, the, uh, the border back in the day. This is typical kind of guy, you know, classic Chinese looking person, and he charged you a dollar or whatever it was to have his picture made your picture made with him. This is, uh, this is my boss, but this is the bridge of the, of the Hissom. And um, Ken McGrother, Roger Strait, he was the uh, electronic materials officer. 
Uh, Ken was the operations boss. And here we have Christmas uh, on the hyssop with uh, putting the decorations on the tree. And, and speaking of Christmas, here was a, as the comm officer, I, I held on to this, but uh, greetings from Taipei. And the best, best of, uh, with 19, what is that, 1969, I think it is. Okay. But anyhow, that was a typical comm communications message. This is just, this is just a cool picture. <laughs> this guy, this is when we were going to, uh, at one point, the, uh, the Combat Information Center officer and I um, went over to the island of Komoi, which the Chinese call Kinmen. And um, interestingly enough, the, the communists would shell Komoi every other day. And we were there on the day that they didn't shell, but then we were told that the day before they had killed a water buffalo. And it was just random shelling. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long that went on, and uh, I assume that it's no longer the case. Um, this is uh, an underway replenishment. This is the, the fuel, fuel line. And um, off the coast of Vietnam, the, the unrep or underway replenishment ships would just run up and down the coast of Vietnam and we would meet up with them if we'd give them our supply list of whatever it was that we needed and we would one of the things that you have to do to to become an officer of the deck is to take the ship alongside for an underway replenishment and the under the unrep ship maintains course and speed and it's the duty of the the ship that's getting replenished to come up behind and come up alongside and you're like 100 feet away, which sounds 100 feet is a pretty good distance, but yet when you got two big ships and they're not really all that maneuverable. We had, one time, we did have a junk that went down in between the two ships. Um, so uh, you're there on the bridge and you're, you're taking, you're watching carefully what the distances are and making sure that you're not closing, closing in. And, and, it, and we did, before I came on board, the the, sh the hissum did graze a, an unrep ship, but fortunately I wouldn't. How long I would something like that take? How long would an unrep take? Golly, well, it would depend to a certain extent how much you were getting, uh, supplies and so forth, but I don't think it would take more than 20, maybe 20 minutes, something like that, 15, 20 minutes. Um, Probably longer than that sometimes as well. So that's uh, a nerve-wracking period. For it oh yeah. I mean, you got the captain. Captain's right there, and um, he is either has the uh, the deck and the con. If you have the if if you have the deck, you are responsible for the overall safety of the ship. If you have the con, you're driving the ship. So the officer of the deck is the higher of the two, and. Uh, when you relieve the watch, you said, "This, this is Mr. Pryor. I have the, I have the deck and the con, or I have the deck, or I have the con, whatever." Right. Um, and when you first report on board, you you would be a junior officer of the deck, and um, basically you're there to learn and make sure that you learn properly all the different stuff. Um, so the unread ships would, would just be going up and down the coast of Vietnam and you'd come and, and be replenished and, uh, and get movies. Um, they would, the, the other ship would always have a, a blackboard with a list of movies that they have because always on the ship, you'd, like 8 o'clock, you'd show a movie in the wardroom. And um, so, yeah, so you'd trade movies back and forth. And, and that, was a, that was, of course, a big deal. Um, this first, this first uh, deployment that I made, when we were coming back, we went down to Australia, as I said, went, did the, the ceremony, and, and I, everybody on board became a shellback. I was a little concerned because I was going to be getting married. And um, one of the things that they would do was cut your hair, and I thought, oh my gosh, the wedding pictures is going to really not, not going to be too good because I'm going to have this haircut. 
Uh, but fortunately, that that was not a not an issue. So anyhow, we go to Australia and, and to Brisbane, and we were there for four days. Uh, one of my fellow officers, Tom Wilson, uh, met a girl there at a party. They had a the, the they had an organization where they welcome uh, American sailors or I guess any American military. But so he goes to a party, and the first thing she says to him, he was, you're late, because he was the engineering officer, and he had to take care of some stuff at the ship. Anyway, they ultimately got married. They're still married today and live in Orlando, Florida. Um, so we leave Brisbane. We didn't have enough fuel. We're steaming independently, of course. We didn't have enough fuel to get all the way from Australia to Pearl Harbor. So we had to go get fuel somewhere. So we went to American Samoa and pango pango so we get to american samoa and we get there at seven in the morning and we figured we'll be there for four hours to get fuel well the captain being a good-hearted guy we go port and starboard which mean with our watches that means half of the ship is is own watch and for two hours and then they get liberty and the 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 first two that that got liberty for the first two hours they come and they assume the watches on the ship well, those guys got so drunk <laughs> in two hours, uh, you, it, was, it was amazing that we were able to get underway. And another thing that happened was um, the, the pumping apparatus in Samoa was about like your average gas station. I mean, it was really, really slow. And so the captain took just enough fuel that he thought could get us back to, to Pearl Harbor, and, and we we took off. We got about halfway back, and this is after like a seven-month deployment for most of the guys. Now, I had joined, I, only, I was only after like four months, but here we are about to get home, heading for Hawaii, and one of the crew comes down with appendicitis, and uh, our hospital corpsman chief uh, makes all preparations to do an appendectomy there in the wardroom because the wardroom table is the operating table for the ship and he's reading up on what he has to do and so forth well we have to turn around and instead of heading for Hawaii we turn back south and we're going back towards Samoa and they sent a helicopter out and got the guy took him to Samoa he did had his appendectomy and he was in Hawaii before we were so we were turning but the other part of the story is that um, we, the captain sent me an email about this, and I had not remembered it. Uh, one of the tank, one of the fuel tanks that we had, was used for ballast, and it was full of seawater. And the engineers thought that it had fuel in it, but no, it was seawater. So he said that we, by the time we got to Hawaii, we were on fumes. It was like, you know, <laughs> and we, plus the fact that we had had to turn around and then and so forth. But, but we made it. Made, we made it okay. So uh, the ship didn't have to switch to the seawater tank. You just had no, no. to stretch the... No, uh -uh. Yeah. I don't know how they found out b before <laughs> <laughs> yeah, making the switch and, <laughs> and getting a, a misfire of the engine. Uh, now, another, another incident with the Hissom... Um, I mean, we, we did a lot of good stuff, but we had things that happened that were kind of, <laughs> kind of interesting. The captain wanted to drive a live depth charge because we had this depth charge rack on the back of the ship. And um, so he had to get permission from way on up the chain of command to, in, to drop a live depth charge because, you know, there are submarines out there that, that are still <laughs> messing around. And... Um, so we get permission, we go to a designated area and so forth, and the captain, I wish I could remember the depths, but I don't remember the depths. He wanted to drop it at, at some given depth, and the leading sonarman says, Captain, uh, you know, that's kind of shallow. You know, we might want to rethink this and drop it. So, okay, so he dropped it 100, we, we, we set it so that it would go off 100 feet deeper. Well, we dropped it, it went off, and it blew a hole and blew a hole in our hull. <laughs> so our... We were taking on, I don't know how many gallons of water a minute, uh, but our damage control guys did their thing, and uh, we were able to, you know, get it shored up, and, and ultimately, I think, I think that was the first cruise that I was on, and then the second one, we, we, we spent some time in, in dry dock and, and got, it, got it fixed properly, but uh, that was another, another little adventure. 
We would sometimes, I mentioned the, the unwrapped ships. We were, that was not the only way that we would get under, get uh, replenishment. This was a vertrip, uh, vertical replenishment. And um, the, the helicopters would come, if we were approaching a port, they might come out from the port um, or they might uh, come from a uh, more typically from an aircraft carrier, and and come out and and now this is uh, there's uh, American Samoa, and one of the beautiful young ladies who was there. This is uh, this is one of the bars of Samoa, and um, this is Zeke Zucker. Zeke to this to this day is an ultra marathoner. Uh, he went from the Hissom to command of a swift boat in Vietnam. This is, uh, let's see. Well, I mentioned uh, the dry dock. There is, uh, there's the Hissom in, uh, in dry dock in, uh, the, in Japan. And uh, here we are. I guess, I think this was the first cruise. Here we are approaching Pearl. You can see the Arizona Memorial over there in the far left side. So after, uh, let me see, after the second cruise of the Hissom, um, I, uh, I requested, uh, I requested a, a shore duty for uh, one of the communication stations and um, instead got uh, orders to be the comm officer for Destroyer Squadron. So I was the uh, comm officer for Desron Destroyer Squadron 29 out of Long Beach. And I don't know if I can remember, but let's see, there, there were six destroyers. They were the Albert David and the Ramsey. Those were the two primary flagships of Desron 29. The Albert David was DE 1050, a destroyer escort, pure destroyer escort. The Ramsey is DEG-2, which is a, a guided missile uh, destroyer escort. And the Ramsey, interestingly enough, uh, the, the missiles that they carried were nuclear capable. So one of my, one of my duties as being the staff comm officer was also as being a sealed authentication system officer, uh, which meant that uh, in the event of uh, the use of nuclear weapons, I was one, one of the people who would authenticate the fact that this was a bona fide mission that we were given. Um, so that was the Ramsey and the Albert David. We also had the O'Brien. The O'Brien, interesting thing about the O'Brien, that was DD 725. I don't know why I remember that particular hull number, but she had a, a, a Irish setter uh, for a mascot that, that was that made, the, made the trip, made the deployments with them. Um, so there's the O'Brien, the Eversole, the Benner, and the Cunningham were the, the six uh, destroyers in Desron 29. Um, let's see. Here we are. This is, there is too much going on here for you to really be able to see this on camera. But um, this is the outline of Vietnam here with ships, positions uh, listed. Here we see Desron 29. You can see some of the ships that are we were the uh, we were the gun line commander, uh, Comdes Ron Twenty Nine. He was a um, a full a full captain, and um, so, so we was were. Was that a shore based facility? No, no. This was this was in this was in. I'm not sure if it was the Rams. Well, I think this was the Albert David. Yeah, I'm sure this was so the Albert David. So, as the Desron communications officer, you went to sea. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. oh yeah. When you oh, yeah. said you were, you know, headquartered in Long Beach, I thought it was shooting. home ported. <laughs> yeah, we were home ported. We, I wasn't in Long Beach long, okay. um, but yeah, we um, the, the two ships that we rode primarily were either the Albert David or the or the Ramsey. Uh, although one time this was one of my deals, we we transferred to the Benner, and the Benner was a pure destroyer and. Um, we were riding into Subic. We got into some heavy weather, and they, being a regular story, didn't have the facilities to accommodate a staff. And so I was on this metal cot. It's like six inches off the deck, and it's got, you know, it's all metal. Doesn't have any kind of rubber feet or anything. And we got into this heavy seas, and I, the thing goes sliding across the deck and <laughs> hits the bulkhead, 
and um, I, we got a rude awakening, literally, from that. From that. This is uh, well. Here's this is the. Okay. Yeah. That's the Albert David. Uh, some some generally somewhat heavy. See now, one time, I never had. It, it was never as bad when on a Desron 29 ship as it was in one particular time when I was on the Hissom, and we were taking 45 degree rolls. So 45 degree rolls means it's as easy to walk on the bulkhead as it is to walk on the deck. Um, that was uh, some serious stuff. This, these, these are the two primary flagships. This is the uh, the Ramsey DEG2 and the Albert David DE1050. And this, I'll just go ahead and, and finish with all the pictures that I have here. This is, this is one of my best pictures. This is uh, an American Airlines plane in, at dawn on the, uh, on the um, runway at Da Nang. And this was when I was getting out of the Navy. And uh, there was a, of course it was full of, full of uh, Army guys and Marines and so forth. And as soon as we lifted off, there was a tremendous cheer as soon as the pilot announced we were leaving Vietnamese airspace, there was a bigger cheer, and uh, that was pretty neat. One of the, but one of the, night, one of the interesting things was uh, we were in the Gulf of Tonkin. I was on, I think, the Ramsey at the time, and went by helicopter, was lifted by helicopter to uh, up into the, uh, transferred over to the uh, aircraft carrier, the Hancock. I think it was the Han either Hancock or the Ranger and um, then flew on the mail plane uh, from the carrier over into Da Nang. So uh, I got one takeoff off the deck of a, of a carrier, which was pretty, pretty interesting stuff. In the Navy at the time, I don't know if it's still true, uh, any passenger faces the rear. And so uh, unlike, uh, you know, you see the, pl the, the, uh, the videos of planes taking off and so forth, you're, you're going this way because your plane's going that way. Um, but that was kind of a, a nice, interesting experience too. You, the plane drip, I mean, the airplane will drop down when you go off the edge of the deck and uh, then takes off and it wasn't a big deal from there on. You mentioned, um, and, I, and I forget where it was in your, uh, your discourse here, that you were going to get married. Were yes. You, did you get married while you were in the Navy or after yes. you were out? Yes. Okay. Got married after the first cruise, after that okay. first cruise. Um, uh, like I say, I was concerned about having a haircut. Uh, but anyhow, got back to, uh, to Atlanta, came back to Atlanta. And uh, we married here, went on our honeymoon to Gatlinburg, and went to Hawaii to live permanently. Okay. So that was pretty nice. We, le we wound up in an apartment next to our a couple that became our very closest friends, uh, John and Elaine Cross. And John was the ship's ASW officer. And of course, I was communications. He was an ensign, I was an ensign. Um, if, uh, if, if they came over to visit, we were in adjacent apartments uh, at Hawaiian Horizon in Pearl City on Oahu. So um, if they wanted to come over and visit, they had to bring their own two chairs uh, because we, we, we had two and that was it and, and vice versa. Uh, it was the other way, same, same way going the other direction. So, but they were uh, uh, very, very close friends. Uh, and I've, unfortunately, John's now passed away, but uh, Elaine, we still, still stay in close touch with Elaine. So how long was she she stayed in Hawaii, correct? While you deployed, while you no, she cruised? came back. She worked for Georgia Power Company. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah. She came back to Atlanta and uh, and worked for Georgia Power. So um, she was an advertising copywriter. Um, but we were able to make a couple of trips to the other islands. We went to Oahu. Uh, went we lived on Oahu, of course, and we went to Kauai and um, Maui, and um, just spent some time at those two and as, as you know didn't didn't have a whole lot of money uh, expendable income back in those days and um, so that was nice and then I must say when we w when we went from Hawaii to Long Beach um, 
my wife was literally crying because going from pristine, gorgeous Hawaii to Long Beach, and it was, this was, I mean, this is California in 69, mm. and it was smoggy, and we were driving past oil refineries with the flames coming up and the smoke and everything, and it was just, and we could, the, the incredible thing is they had such tremendous produce there, <laughs> really good stuff, but the good side, of, we saw, we had some good times there. Um, got to see John Gary at the Fairmont Hotel. We went to a taping of the Dean Martin show, and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was one of the guests. Um, we, we went to Chavez Ravine, saw the Braves play the Dodgers, and lo and behold, so help me, Hank Aaron run, won the game uh, in extra innings with a home run. So that was pretty cool. Um, but uh, working under the Commodore was nothing like working for the, the, the two commanding officers of the HISM. It was just an entirely different kind of thing. You didn't have the, the, the HISM group bonded incredibly well. In fact, just this last September, uh, we had a, a reunion of the HISM wardroom. And um, I, I can't tell you how many people were there. About Ten former officers were there, I think, including both commanding officers. Uh, both Captain Barber and Captain Toole were, were there. Captain Toole now has his own, uh, has a bookstore in Washington, D.C., and goes by Jim Toole. He's, uh, he's an irascible um, kind of guy, but gave the, the, most, the most touching talk about the Hissom crew and everything. You know, for these career guys, this was just one ship of, of several, but something, we just really did get something along well. And, yeah, yeah. yeah it was, uh, Is it, the Hissom still a, a, no. an active ship? The, one of the most, one of gut-wrenching photographs I have ever looked at. You look up the Hissom, you can find it. If you Google the Hissom, you'll see a photograph of the Hissom as it was a target. Uh, in the Pacific. Now it's, it's now out there in the Pacific somewhere and it was just a, 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 a bombing target. I mean, it's a reef for, now. Yeah, yeah, but uh, to see the, the mass over and it's all rusty looking and uh, it was just not, not very good. I'll pass along something that I, I'm thinking in terms of this reunion that I had. Um, we went around telling stories about the Hissom First, uh, a story that Captain Barber told. He said that at one point, this would have been on the first cruise, um, he said that uh, we were called upon to do some, some, some gunfire support. There was an area that some, we were coming into and they wanted some gunfire support in a particular area, but there was a sandbar uh, just out from the coast and so it was pretty tricky getting in there. We weren't sure really the depths, whether the depths had changed from the charts that were indicated. So we finally figured, well, yeah, we can probably do it. We can probably get in close enough to, to, to do some good. So we do just go just inch along going as in as far as we can. And um, at this point, the, the captain says, XO, XO was the chief navigator. Uh, XO, um, you, you think we ought to hold it here or, or can we go on further? And he says, Captain, I think we ought to go on further, no question about it. And so, but the captain's really not so sure and he says, XO, um, if this were your ship, what would you do? And the XO was quiet for a minute or two and says, Captain, I would have turned around <laughs> half mile back. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was Captain Barber and the, X, the XO, this first was Ed Hart, and what a great, great guy. He was a Mustang, tremendous executive officer. Um, uh, he, um, at one time, we had an emergency recall of the ship because we had a, a SAR mission, search and rescue. And as a matter of fact, we, as it ultimately came out, there were a number of, of uh, fishermen who, were, who died, and we, we found, we, arrived at their boat and they had already, the, the survivors had already been taken off from elsewhere, but the boat was still there. At any rate, 
it was like the middle of the night and we had an emergency recall of all the crew and so that basically means that they send guys ashore to round up whoever they can find and get them on the ship and so that we get enough people on board that we can go out and, and try to try to help out. Where was this? It was in Taiwan and I'm not okay. sure which of the two ports, whether it's Kaohsiung or, or Keelung. Um, but we, uh, again, the, the, the XO being the navigator, the XO, um, he, he would party pretty good. And so he comes back and he, and so the, the captain says, XO, uh, give me a, give me a course to the, to the spot where we, where, where we think the, the SAR incident occurred. And uh, the XO says, Captain, I, I'd, I'd go out of the harbor a mile and hang a left, <laughs> which is not, not exactly the precision that <laughs> the, the captain not, would have liked. Nautical terminology. Yeah. But let me tell you this other story about Ed Hart. Soon after I had reported on board the ship, we were underway, and this was literally probably the first day or so that I had been at sea on the ship. Um, met the happened to pass the XO on the mess decks, saluted him, went my way. There, there are men there drinking coffee, whatever. Well, the next morning we had we have officers call uh, every morning on the ship, and and that's where the executive officer gives you the plan of the day, tells tells you what's going to be going on for that day, what's you know we're doing market time or whatever, and and um, so he the. We are, the officers are lined up as a group, and the XO comes, we salute him, he returns our salute, and then he gives us stuff, and we are dispersed. Well, the XO said, I want to go over some shipboard procedure with everybody. He says, um, you know, when you salute me, when we're underway, and you salute me at officer's call, that's it for the day. You don't salute me anymore after that. And I knew that he was talking to me, but he didn't stop me the day before on the mess decks in front of the enlisted men. Um, he was getting the, I got the message, but what, what a great example of leadership. Uh, I've never forgot, I've told that a hundred times at least, but I, that was, I was so impressed by, by what he did. Um, he well, was just a great guy. Tell us a little bit about your post-Navy life. Well, uh, got out, I, I got back to Atlanta in March of 1970 and frankly took a, took a month off <laughs> just uh, after I got here. My wife was, was working at Georgia Power um, and uh, wife Barbara and so then I started looking for a job and uh, wound up at WSB Television. So uh, in May of 1970, I started at WSB TV in the promotion department. I had majored in advertising public relations. And so I started at, at channel, it was channel two, well it still is channel two, but it was an NBC affiliate. And um, I was um, um, doing, doing promos, promoting, doing different things, to, writing news releases. Uh, putting together video promos, promoting different shows uh, on the station. What a what a great job it was! I mean, fun fun job. I mean, for a young young person, it was just spectacular. Uh, I particularly I, I do some running now, and have for for a good number of years. But I particularly remember um, back in those days, WSB TV every year put together the 4th of July parade, the Salute to America parade. And we didn't, now they farm it out. But back then, it was the promotion department did the whole shooting match. And so we were, I was driving down Peachtree uh, early morning on the 4th of July. And I remember seeing these runners in the far left-hand lane. I mean, no, I don't remember, if they were police escorts, I sure don't remember it. But just a handful of runners, and that was the Peachtree Road Race. race. Um, in 1970, and um, so yeah, worked at WSB TV. Um, worked in a small uh, advertising PR uh, company. After that, I had a number of PR jobs. The significant ones were WSB TV. Um, I worked for the Southern Forest Institute, which was a terrific job. Working for a guy named Jim Montgomery. We would go around promoting. 
uh, forest management in the South. So I went all over the South talking with uh, editorial boards and doing television interviews and so forth, talking about how important it was to manage your forest. Obviously, the, in the best interest of the forest products industry to have that resource um, in the pipeline. Um, and then I worked for Lockheed for about uh, six years or so. Uh, wrote speeches for three Lockheed presidents, uh, Bob Wormsby, uh, Paul Fritch, and uh, Ken Canestra. Ken Canestra finally went on to be on the Board of Regents, and so I crossed paths with, with, with Canestra. Uh, I, I tell people my, my best career move that I made was getting laid off at Lockheed because I went from Lockheed to working for the University of Georgia and uh, worked for the University of Georgia a little over 20 years. Um, that, that's the good news. The bad news is that was 20 years of commuting from Dunwoody to Athens five days a week. So, and actually the, in the early stages, I was, uh, I was, my title was Special Assistant to the President. So I was in the President's office writing his speeches and, and writing his correspondence. And um, I would often have to go there on Sunday and make that drive. To, uh, and so I had the opportunity to, to get into the government relations area, which I did. So I, uh, I spent most of my time there in, in government relations, working under a guy named Larry Weatherford, who is just a great, great guy. I was very fortunate to hook up with Larry. And he's a dear friend to this day. But I retired from the University of Georgia in 2010. Well, tell us about your family. Um, Barbara and I, were, of course, were married in, in 68 and um, 76. We were blessed to have a daughter named Catherine. We named her Catherine Elaine. Elaine's the, the, the na name of our good friend in, who now lives in Williamsburg. And, uh, but uh, then Catherine has, uh, has two sons, um, Peter and Robert. And uh, Peter is uh, six, and Robert's just about to turn three. And uh, Barbara sells residential real estate for Harry Norman. And a um, number of years ago, she, uh, she found this house that is a mile away from us. We are just off Shamley Dunwoody Road. This, um, this house is on the other side of Shamley Dunwoody. But she liked, really liked this house. She got Catherine and her husband, Brian, interested in it and lo and behold they wound up buying the house so they are 1.1 miles away from us. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, Catherine's husband Brian is a first sergeant in Marine Corps and um, he's in the Marine Corps Reserves. He's done I think it's like 18 years, has a couple of years more to go but he makes a trip uh, every month to Richmond, Virginia for his reserve duty. Um, she is, uh, we, and, and fortunately, Brian's parents and Barbara and I, um, we were closer friends than, from back in the day than, than Catherine and Brian were. They, were. they were in grammar school together. They were in the fourth grade together, Catherine and Brian. We have a photograph of the in a fourth grade I mean, a picture. Um, and so Jim and Arlene became good friends, and uh, we've been good friends all along. Then when, when Brian was being deployed, uh, he, uh, his unit guarded the USS Cole, which had been bombed, in, I think in Libya, if I'm not mistaken, in, at any rate. He um, did that uh, in active duty. Then later, uh, he spent seven months at al-Assad. Um, guarding the perimeter there. So uh, proud, of, proud of both of them. And Catherine, of course, works right here at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, her main, main duty is the uh, Swan House Ball, but uh, she does promotional things that, that benefit the History Center, if I have that correct. Basically, that's, that's what she does, and we are, we are very blessed. Well, good. Um, good story. Uh, we, we like to close out with giving the interviewee an opportunity <clears throat> excuse me, to say whatever they want to say, comments, editorial, information, you know, views, whatever. Um, let, uh, let me, I will page through, as I say, I was a writer, and let me see if there's anything 
here. That might uh, might be interesting. Uh, well, one thing I neglected to mention, at one point I was the boarding officer when we were doing market time. And um, so I would have a 45 and, and we I had a, a sailor with me who had a, um, had a rifle and the 50 caliber from the ship was trained, trained on us. And we would get in the motor whale boat. We would get it, you actually get in the motor whale boat when it's still up out of the water and you're lowered down into the water and, and, and go. And uh, it was generally um, uneventful. Uh, I, one thing that was kind of curious, I remember they used to, they would store their, the fish that they had, these are all fishing junks, they would store the fish that they had caught in, in sawdust for refrigeration. They didn't have ice, but they had sawdust, and that just seemed kind of strange to me. The other thing that, that I ran across, um, the only time in my life I've encountered this, but one of the guys on the ship was a leper, and uh, he actually was a card-carrying leper and was missing some of his fingers, which is, you know, you don't see that every day. And I had, and that, but that was, uh, that was one of the things that I encountered as, as the boarding That's a surprise. officer. surprise. Yeah, very much so. Considering the confined space that, uh, yeah. was work, that you all were working in. Um, the, uh, this is just kind of an uh, interesting side note, I guess, that my first roommate when I, became, when I went with uh, Com Desron 29, was uh, R.S. Hardy, and Hardy was the executive officer of the USS Vance during the the Marcus Aurelius uh, Arn, the Aurelius Arnheiter affair, where Arnheiter became the commanding officer of the Vance, and I mean this was like the Kane Mutiny movie. Right. He was um, I don't know if you would say he was certifiably well he had he was disturbed and um, was relieved of his command after a very short tenure. But uh, the, uh, my roommate was with the XO there. I mean, he was the next in command of, of, on the Vance, which was pretty interesting. Um, when we were the gun, we were the gun line commander on, on the Albert uh, David, we would, we would be anchored in Da Nang Harbor uh, during the day and at eight, 8.30 in the evening, we would get underway and, and fire. And this was, the thing that was incredible to me, uh, one of the things, this was, this was like 69, 70. And to think that the, the, how long we had been fighting in Vietnam, and yet here we were in one of the most secure cities in South Vietnam, and we were shooting at bad guys from the harbor. I mean, that just seemed something's not right here, and um, and and it wasn't. I might mention too that um, that I actually did not. I was, as a reservist, I was in for three three years of active duty, and I did not serve three years. This was when Richard Nixon was one of the good things he did, as far as I was concerned. He was uh, he was kind of gearing down uh, with, the, with the war and the personnel in Vietnam. And um, so I, I got an early out and um, served a little bit less than, than my full three years. But I haven't, frankly, I really have not found anybody else who did three different deployments uh, off the years. coast of Vietnam. So I, I, I don't back up to the <laughs> my DD-214. I, uh, I'm, I'm proud that I was able to do that. Well, good. Yeah. We appreciate you telling your story to us. It thank was, you. It's really interesting. And, yeah. and uh, thank you for participating in the project, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Sue.